It does not matter how much you know. What matters is how much you practice. As a teacher, it does not matter how much you know. What matters is how much you can convey. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma iftah alayna fatuh al-alifin. Wa ufiqna tawfiq al-salihin. Wa ufa'na Allahumma bil-Qur'an wa al-dhikri al-hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una. Wa ufa'na bima alamtana. Wa zidna ilma yuqarribuna minka bi rahmatika ya arham al-rahimin. اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم أعذنا من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Translation of this prayer O oh Allah, grant us knowledge that benefits us and allow us to benefit from what we learn and increase us in knowledge that brings us closer to you. O oh Allah, nothing is easy save for what you make easy. You are the one indeed who eases everything. O oh Allah, protect us against the evil of ourselves and the evil deeds that we commit. Amend all of our affairs. There's no God other than you. To you is our return. Prayers upon Muhammad, our master, the one we sent to us and upon his companions and his family. Talking about remembrance of God, remembrance of Allah, leads to a question. This talk is not about the virtues of remembrance, it's about the manners of remembrance. I believe it was announced so, right? It is not about the remembrance. By remembrance, we mean dhikr. Invocation, remembrance, repetition, utterances. It is well established that remembrance and invocations are one of the most, most virtuous acts we do in Islam to bring us closer to God. I'm not going to speak about the virtues, I'm going to speak how it is done, the manners the style, or the adab, the behavior. Few people speak and ponder on this area. But I want to start with this question and answer. Remembering Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty. Now, why should we ask this question? Why should we need to remember Allah? It looks quite strange to need to remember Allah. If someone has done you so much good and extended to you so many favors, would you ever forget him or her? If you love someone, you get in total love, engrossed with someone, would you forget him or her? You didn't. So you don't need to remember them, because you are always in memory of them. The insane of Layla, you're familiar with these love stories from our Arabic literature. The insane of Layla. He was in love with Layla till he became an insane person, though he was 
most sane person, and wisest of all, his poetry is reference in our Arabic literature, he produced some of the most marvelous pieces of uh, poetry. He saw Layla in everything. It happened that Layla was a dark girl. He loved everything dark for the sake of Layla. He saw Layla wherever he went, her images in front of him. He never forgot Layla. This is for someone loving someone in this world. What about Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shouldn't we ask this question? People who remember Allah are the ones who forget Him. You shouldn't forget Allah. If you want a proof, just look at your life from when you were born till time when He asked you to pray. For 15 years, God has been taking care of you, extending to you every kind of favor, putting you under His grace. Isn't this enough to love Him? The problem is we are veiled. We don't see Him. We see our parents doing us favors. We don't see Him. We see the teachers. We don't see Him. We see the money in our hands. We get veiled from the real giver. The real giver is Allah. And forget about the gifts. God should be loved even without any gifts given to you. Because He's God. Can't you see Him, His wisdom, His miracles, His power in everything in this universe? Everything in this universe speaks of God. وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لَهُ آيَةٌ تَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ وَاحِدُ In everything, he has put a sign. There is a sign that tells you he is the one. He is the creator. From that angle, we see great Gnostics, Sufi masters in Islam speaking about not the need to remember Allah, but wondering how would you dare forget Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. ما غاب عني ولكن لست أذكره إلا وقلت جهارا قل هو الله is not absent from my sight now doing remembrance of God is to add a pleasure to a pleasure there's a pleasure in witnessing God in your heart but there is an extra pleasure in having his name repeated by your tongue We do it the other way around now. We start remembering Allah, invoking His names by utterances in our tongues in order for our hearts to remember God. You see how things are provoked? For great saints, it's the other way around. The heart forces you to mention God. Why? To seek the pleasure and add it. When you get good food in front of you, you would like to taste it, you would like to smell it. You like both the smell and the taste. A lot of times, one sense is not enough. You would like to share all your senses in having a pleasure or enjoying it. The same in this case. Al-Hasan al-Basri, the famous great scholar and saint, and a student of Sayyiduna Ali, because of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was seen holding a subha, rosary, or beads for remembering Allah. He was asked, you, in your status, you need to hold a subha, as though as the person in his rank doesn't need to do it. He has reached a high level in knowing God. He said, I would like to make mention of Allah by my heart, by my tongue, and by my hand. Inni uhibbu 
أن أذكر الله تعالى بقلبي ولساني ويدي having three members of the body working together for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you see how beautiful this is if we agree on this principle let us start talking about the manners of this remembrance I want you to start reflecting on how often you forget Allah or how often you remember Allah when we speak about dhikr remembrance of Allah we assign usually we assign a certain task to every believer so that in the morning in the evening they should sit and start recollecting repeating the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or certain prayers certain sentences certain verses of the Quran al-Kareem some of this dhikr is seeking forgiveness astaghfirullah some is tawheed la ilaha illallah some la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah there's no power except by Allah some prayers on the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and salutations sent to him some hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil Allah suffices from us some calling Allah 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 or Ya Latif, Ya Latif, Ya Latif, the one who provides subtle, subtle care. Names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, verses of the Quran we repeat, they have a huge impact on us. The impact varies depending on the meanings of the words and the names. These meanings have effect on us spiritually, which would reflect on our behavior. And force us to change without us noticing. This is one of the major benefits of dhikr. A lot of people think that by doing dhikr, remembrance of Allah, the only thing you get is rewards in afterlife, in al jannah Indeed, there are a lot of rewards for every letter, for every sentence. You are familiar with several pieces of tradition, hadith, of our master, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who says, for example, when you say, subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim, this sentence glorifying Allah, a huge tree is planted for you in al-Jannah. A tree of a size of 500 miles. You walk underneath its shade for 500 miles and you're still under the shade of that tree planted for you when you just say one sentence all it takes is a couple of seconds subhanallah alhamdulillah subhanallah al this is an example but uh, the other goal we have when we do dhikr is to help us change psychologically spiritually in our behavior on all of these levels and dhikr is a remedy dhikr is a remedy Exactly as when you get sick, you go to a doctor, he gives you a prescription for headache, for uh, infection, for uh, any type of uh, ailment. The same, our psyche, our soul, our heart uh, gets affected by darkness, gets affected by temptations, gets affected by whisperings of Satan and so on. And we get serious diseases. And these diseases... Uh, are difficult to handle on our own. Our uh, parents would help us getting rid of bad habits, but it's very difficult uh, to have help getting rid of envy, if you have envy, for example, for someone. If you have a problem uh, of lying, it's very difficult to, to, for any authority to tell you to do it, uh, to get rid of it. Uh, the only help in this regard is spiritual help. Spiritual help. This uh, area is not highlighted. This is why we need this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole journey is about treatments of the ailments of the hearts, getting rid of the diseases of the hearts. Dhikr is another way of expanding your visions. We see with our eyes 
according to certain uh, limitations and uh, angles. We cannot see from behind and we cannot see far ahead of us, but, uh, and we can't see in the darkness. But when your power, spiritual power, is expanded, you can see, anticipate, witness a lot of things. Dhikr is the means to reach such states when you discover things, when you hear things, when you receive knowledge, when you do things usually you are incapable of doing or seeing or hearing. It is through the power of dhikr, remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we stay without food for I don't know for how long you can resist staying without food. This generation can't stay even without a meal a day. If they miss a meal a day, they complain. Especially in the West and Scandinavia here, like every meal is, is a must every day. You miss one meal, your day is gone and you're broken. Well, I don't know how much you can resist, but let's say a couple of days without food, you collapse if not trained you will collapse. You feel no energy at all. Why? Because your body works only when it is fed. When it is not, when there is no reserve energy, then you collapse. Now what about our spirit? Aren't we made of two? Right? Can anyone deny this fact? We are made of two things, body and spirit. The proof of this is dead people. Why the people can't move? What happened to them? It's not about the heart stopping to beat. It's not about the brain dying. It's about the soul got out of the body. The soul got out of the body. The eyes are there, but the body can't see. The ears are there, but the body can't hear. The hands, legs are there, but the body can't move. Why there is a spirit? The spirit, a ruh, is a great secret from Allah. It cannot be examined by labs. In labs, they examine the body. Physiology. This is the science of physiology. They examine the body. Now, the spirit cannot be put into examinations in labs to discover its secrets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenged the humanity with the secrets of the soul, the spirit, the soul. ويسألونك عن الروح قل الروح من أمر ربي وما أوتيتم من العلم إلا قليلا. We read in Surah Al-Isra. They ask you about the ruh, about the soul. Tell them, say to them, the soul is a matter of my Lord. It belongs to my Lord. It's a secret. You have not been given of knowledge but a very little. This little is equal to a drop. In the story of Moses and Al-Khadir, you remember the story from the Quran al-Kareem. Moses, Musa alayhi salam, peace be upon him, the Prophet, accompanied this saint, this great learned person. Allah ordered him to accompany him, to learn from him. He learned from him a lot. By the end, Musa alayhi salam couldn't understand what the Khadr was doing, Al-Khadr was doing. He explained to him. After explaining to him, they were by the seaside. There was a little bird that picked up some water from the sea and went, flew away. Al-Khadr said to Musa, alayhi salam, your knowledge and my knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah is but a drop like what this little bird picked up from this great ocean. And this is just as an example. So this spirit, soul, the ruh, needs to be nourished. It needs food. It gets weak, it becomes strong. We should be worried about its state. Most people, especially in this materialistic world, bother about our bodies. In Scandinavia here, there is obsession with forms and being fit and informed and weights and diets and 
all these type of things. People are crazy about it. Shouldn't we get worried about our soul? With your body, all you can do, for example, is run. How fast? A few seconds, 100 meters, you make a record. This is the best you can do when you eat well, train well, get fit. But when your spirit, your soul is so strong, your body can stay anywhere, even in your bed, and your soul cruises around the world to pick up knowledge and comes back to you with things are un